Hello, and welcome to Performance-Based Design Considerations in Development of Loop-Mediated Isothermal Amplification Lamp Assays for Pathogen Detection, a production of the University of California, Davis, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory Center for Point-of-Care Technologies. This course is designed to provide instruction in point-of-care technologies for critical emergency disaster medicine. Learning Objectives After an introduction to the fundamentals of LAMP, the audience will understand the advantages and disadvantages of LAMP and be able to determine which application scenarios are well suited for LAMP. The audience will learn which resources are available for LAMP primer design and best practices in LAMP primer design. Upon comparison of various LAMP detection methods, the audience will be able to select the best detection method for a given application. Diagnostic performance metrics will be defined and demonstrated with examples so that the audience will understand the proper use of the performance metrics for quantifying assay performance. The audience will learn which LAMP experimental parameters may be varied and how to systematically optimize LAMP assay performance and down-select candidate LAMP primer sets. Segment 1, Introduction to Loop-Mediated Isothermal Amplification, or LAMP. Loop-Mediated Isothermal Amplification, or LAMP, is a new and exciting nucleic acid amplification technology. It was first developed in 1998 by Icon Chemical Company. In 2000, the first peer-reviewed publication describing LAMP was published. Shortly thereafter, commercial reagent kits for LAMP assays were produced by Icon Chemical Company. Although LAMP is a relatively new technology, its use is growing rapidly. As seen in the chart, the number of LAMP publications per year is accelerating, with over 70 publications in 2008 and over 250 publications to date. The LAMP technology for nucleic acid amplification has been demonstrated for a very wide variety of targets. Over 200 genes or species have been specifically detected by LAMP assays, as reported in the literature. The targets include specific genes, viruses, protista, bacteria, and fungi, among others. The species detected include the agents responsible for many clinically important diseases and conditions, including SARS, HIV, and malaria. The chemical pathway for nucleic acid amplification in LAMP is complex. LAMP employs four to six primers, which recognize six to eight specific sequences. DNA amplification is accomplished through the use of BST DNA polymerase, which exhibits strand displacing activity. Because BST DNA polymerase is capable of displacing double stranded DNA during polymerization, a thermal denaturation step is not required. This strand displacing activity allows the lamp reaction to proceed under isothermal conditions in contrast to PCR, which requires a thermal denaturation step to produce single-stranded DNA for primer binding. The key feature of LAMP is the generation of artificial stem loop structures flanking the target sequence. These stem loop structures allow for self-priming as well as provide a single-stranded region for inner primers and loop primers to bind and initiate DNA polymerization. In the reaction scheme shown, the core pathway of LAMP is illustrated for a four-primer LAMP reaction. The first four steps illustrate the generation of the artificial stem loops. In step one, the forward inner primer binds to the target sequence and initiates polymerization. In step two, the forward outer primer binds to the product and through strand displacement, displaces a structure with a single artificial stem loop appended to the target region. In step three, reverse inner primer binds to the product and initiates DNA polymerization. In step four, reverse outer primer binds to the product and displaces a product with two artificial stem loops flanking the target sequence. This concludes the first phase of the LAMP pathway. 
The next phase of the lamp pathway is the main amplification cycle. In step 5, one of the terminal stem loops self-primes and generates double-stranded DNA along the length of the target. In step 6, forward inner primer binds to the single-stranded loop of the stem loop and initiates DNA polymerization with strand displacement. In step 7, a terminal stem loop self-primes and displaces product P3. P3 can continue with many subsequent amplification steps, including self-priming at terminal stem loops and priming by inner primer binding to single-stranded loops. Steps 8, 9, and 10 proceed exactly as in steps 5, 6, and 7, with the displacement of product P4 and the regeneration of the original double stem looped structure. This central amplification cycle repeats continuously throughout the lamp reaction and generates many copies of P3 and P4. In subsequent amplification steps which are not depicted, products P3 and P4 grow to very large structures that contain many copies of the target sequence. The lamp reaction takes place under isothermal conditions, typically at temperatures between 60 and 65 degrees Celsius. There are many required reagents for the lamp reaction, with typical concentrations listed here. In addition to the inner primers and outer primers we observed previously, the lamp reaction can also utilize loop primers. Loop primers are additional optional primers that are designed to bind to stem loops present in lamp structures that are the wrong sense to bind to inner primers. The use of loop primers was initially reported to accelerate the lamp reaction. Lamp has several advantages. First, it is a rapid nucleic acid amplification technique. Amplification can be observed in less than 20 minutes and it is often faster than PCR. Second, LAMP is both sensitive and specific. The use of four to six primers that recognize six to eight sequences add to the specificity of LAMP. Third, the LAMP reaction is isothermal. The isothermal reaction conditions allow for uninterrupted amplification, unlike PCR, enhancing the amplification speed. Fourth, due to the isothermal reaction conditions, the equipment needed to run lamp reactions can be simpler and cheaper than other nucleic acid amplification technologies. There are some disadvantages to the lamp reaction, however. First, as lamp uses four to six primers, the primer design is more complex than for PCR. Second, as we will discuss later, most detection methods used with lamp are not sequence specific so it may be very difficult to verify the nature of the amplification product. And lastly, unlike PCR, it is currently difficult to multiplex lamp reactions in a single tube. Taking these advantages and disadvantages into account, we see that lamp is well suited for some applications. Because of the simpler and cheaper instrumentation requirements, LAMP is well suited for limited resource situations. This includes applications at the point of care or other extra laboratory testing environments. Additionally, LAMP is well suited for diagnostic applications that have a small to moderate test menu. And finally, LAMP is very appropriate for scenarios when rapid diagnostic results are critical. On the other hand, due to the limitations of LAMP discussed earlier, LAMP is not well suited for applications that have a very large test menu, as it is difficult to multiplex LAMP reactions. Also, because LAMP primer design requires knowledge of the target sequence, LAMP is not the method of choice for detecting targets for which no genetic sequence information exists. Segment 2, LAMP Primer Design the proper design of LAMP primers requires a step-by-step -step approach. First, the LAMP assay must be well-defined. 
the user must define the desired targets of the lamp assay, that is, which species or strains are required to give a positive reaction. In addition, the user must define the non-targets, or the species or strains that are required to give a negative reaction. After defining the lamp assay targets, the gene sequences for all available targets and non-targets should be gathered. Next, through sequence alignments, the user should identify which gene regions are conserved among all targets. This is very important to ensure the lamp assay will exhibit high sensitivity. Subsequently, the user must make sure that these conserved regions are also unique by screening the conserved sequences against the genomes of all available non-targets. This step is very important in designing LAMP assays with high specificity. Now that conserved and unique sequences have been identified, the user can design LAMP primers using automated software packages. The first software package for LAMP primer design is Primer Explorer. Primer Explorer is an automated LAMP primer design tool provided by Fujitsu Limited and Icon Chemical Company and is available at http primerexplorer.jp forward slash e. The Primer Explorer package runs on Internet Explorer version 5.0 or higher on the Windows operating system. Primer Explorer accepts multiple input file types. However, one very important limitation is that the input files must be shorter than 2,000 base pairs. The throughput of the Primer Explorer package is a single file at a time, with several manual steps during the primer design process. Additionally, the UC Davis LLNL Center for Point of Care Technologies has developed an additional LAMP primer design tool the LAMP Assay Versatile Analysis, or LAVA, software package. LAVA includes support for multiple operating systems, not just Windows. LAVA allows for simultaneous design of all primers, including loop primers, in a single step, unlike the two-step process in Primer Explorer. Also, LAVA accepts input sequences much larger than the 2000 base pair limit for Primer Explorer and allows for automated batch processing. LAVA is scheduled for public release in 2009. In summary, there are several best practices that should be followed when designing LAMP primers. First, after defining the LAMP assay, in order to maximize sensitivity, the user should collect as many genome sequences as possible from all available target strains or species. Second, although the loop primers were originally described as optional, they should be included in primer design if at all possible. Third, because the performance of a single set of LAMP primers may be unsatisfactory, it is best to begin by designing a large number of primer sets, perhaps 10. Finally, the primer sequences should be screened against genetic near-neighbor gene sequences to check for possible cross-reactions that would decrease specificity. Segment 3, LAMP Detection Technologies. LAMP amplicons, or lamplicons, are different than PCR amplicons. And in order to select a suitable detection technique, we must first understand the nature of lamplicons. First, lamplicons are double-stranded DNA with occasional stem loops, while PCR amplicons are double-stranded DNA. Second, the length of lamp amplicons is variable. They can be as small as approximately 300 base pairs with no upper limit beyond exhaustion of DNTPs. In contrast, PCR amplicons are usually a very exact size, typically between 100 and 1,000 base pairs. Next, because of the large size and stem loops, the shape of lamplicons has been described as cauliflower-like, while PCR amplicons are short and linear. The number of copies of the target gene in PCR amplicons is 1, 
but in LAMP there can be many, many copies per amplicon. Finally, at the end of amplification, the concentration of lamplicons can approach 800 micrograms per milliliter, while PCR may only reach a concentration of closer to 4 to 40 micrograms per milliliter. Now that we have described the properties of LAMP amplicons, or lamplicons, we will take a brief survey of detection technologies that can be coupled to LAMP. The first detection technology that we will study is gel electrophoresis. This detection technique was first described for LAMP in the first LAMP publication in 2000. In gel electrophoresis, the lamplicons are separated by size or mobility in a 2% acarose gel, followed by staining to aid visualization. As the size of lamplicons is variable, gel electrophoresis often results in smears. This technique is an endpoint detection used to verify amplification after the lamp reaction is completed. Since it requires only an electrophoresis workstation, this method has the advantage of relatively inexpensive hardware requirements. However, this endpoint detection method is relatively slow, not quantitative, and requires post-amplification manual procedures which may result in contamination of workspaces with lamp amplicons. The second detection technology we will study is endpoint turbidimetry. This was first demonstrated for lamp in 2001. DNA polymerization of DNTPs releases pyrophosphate, which, in the presence of magnesium, precipitates as magnesium pyrophosphate. As an endpoint detection method, the reaction volume may be simply analyzed on a spectrophotometer or turbidimeter. This method is extremely rapid, but requires expensive equipment. One notable variation is naked eye turbidimetry. In this variation, when the lamp reaction is finished, the great amount of magnesium pyrophosphate precipitate may often be detected by the naked eye. Next, we will examine real-time turbidimetry. This technique, first demonstrated for LAMP in 2001, follows the LAMP reaction in real time. The LAMP reaction chamber is simply placed inside a turbidimeter and the turbidity is monitored over time. This method is rapid and may be quantitative, but requires expensive equipment. The fourth technique is endpoint fluorescence. This technique was first demonstrated in 2000 and often takes place by the addition of a fluorescent dye that intercalates into double-stranded DNA. After the lamp reaction has completed, the concentration of double-stranded DNA is very large and the fluorescent signal is increased. This endpoint detection is very rapid but requires expensive equipment and is not quantitative. It, like endpoint turbidimetry, can also be observed by the naked eye. Next, we have real-time fluorescence. First demonstrated in 2000, this technique follows the increase in the fluorescence of a dye molecule in real time as the lamp reaction proceeds. While rapid and often quantitative, this technique also requires expensive instrumentation. Our next technique is lateral flow device detection. This technique, first demonstrated in 2008, is an endpoint detection technique. Through the use of biotinylated primers and an additional sequence-specific fluorescently labeled probe, the lamplicons flow down a lateral flow device, bind to an avidin strip, and generate a colored band. This technique is sequence-specific, as well as relatively rapid and inexpensive. However, it is not quantitative, requires post-amplification handling of amplicons, which may result in contamination events, and requires the design of an additional probe. The last technique in our survey is ABC LAMP, or Alternately Binding Quenching Probe Competitive LAMP. 
It was first demonstrated in 2007 and is a somewhat complex technique involving the simultaneous amplification of target DNA and a, a synthetic competitor DNA in the same reaction tube. A fluorescently labeled probe, which can specifically bind only to the target DNA, indicates the amount of target DNA amplified in relation to the synthetic competitor DNA. This technique is sequence specific, quantitative, and rapid, but does require an expensive fluorimeter as well as the design of an additional probe molecule and synthetic competitor DNA. In conclusion, there are many different detection technologies that may be coupled with lamp amplification. The best choice depends on the specific application. For scenarios that are extremely resource limited, the most inexpensive choice is naked eye turbidimetry or naked eye fluorescence, which can be performed with just a heating bath. If sensitivity is critical and resources are not so extremely limited, real-time turbidimetry and real-time fluorimetry are good choices. If your application demands sequence-specific detection, a lateral flow device or ABC lamp can meet your needs. Segment 4, Diagnostic Performance Metrics. When running a single lamp reaction, how do you decide if the result is positive or negative? In this example, we will examine real-time fluorimetry lamp. In such an experiment, the user must set threshold and cutoff values to determine if individual results are positive or negative. First, as a lamp reaction monitored by real-time fluorescence proceeds, the fluorescence signal increases as double-stranded DNA is produced. The user must set a threshold fluorescence intensity value, or IT, significantly above background noise levels, that indicates when a reaction has produced double-stranded DNA product. The time at which the real-time fluorescence value crosses this threshold intensity value is called the threshold time, or TT. Also, the user should set a cutoff time, or TCO. The cutoff time is an upper limit to acceptable TT values, or, in other words, a positive result occurs only when TT is less than TCO. By setting such threshold and cutoff values for your detection technique, you can assign positive or negative res results to each individual lamp reaction. Now, going beyond a single lamp reaction, the lamp assay itself should be examined. How can we measure the performance of a lamp assay? We could ask questions such as, does it always give the correct answer? How fast is the assay? And are the re results reproducible? To help us quantitatively measure the performance of a lamp assay, we will use several defined diagnostic performance metrics. As we introduce the various diagnostic performance metrics, we will use an example of a penny detector, as may be present in a coin counting machine. The first step in calculating diagnostic performance metrics is to define the objective of the assay. The user must define both which samples should test positive and which samples should test negative. In our example, all pennies should test positive while all other coins should test this negative. Next, the user should gather a large set of samples and determine the actual status by a reference method. Make sure to include several positive as well as negative samples in your test set. Our test set includes 12 coins, four of which were determined to be pennies by a reference method, and eight of which were determined to be other coins by a reference method. The actual status, positive or negative, must be measured by a trusted reference method. Next, the user should test each sample in the test set using the test method. By using threshold and cutoff values, 
the user can assign each sample a positive or negative test result. Sometimes, the test result will agree with the actual status determined by the reference method. Sometimes, it will disagree. Next, the user should construct a 2x2 two two contingency table, as shown. Actual positive samples that test positive are called true positives. Actual positive samples that test negative are called false negatives. Actual negative samples that test negative are called true negatives, and actual negative samples that test positive are called false positives. The numbers of true positives, false negatives, true negatives, and false positives are counted and inserted into the table, along with the subtotals and totals as displayed. This filled-in contingency table is the basis for calculating all of our diagnostic performance metrics. The first diagnostic performance value we will calculate is the sensitivity. The sensitivity is defined as the fraction of actual positive samples that tested positive. In our test case, we have a total of four actual positive samples, and three of them tested positive. So our sensitivity is 3 divided by 4, or 75%. Next, we can calculate specificity. The specificity is defined as the fraction of actual negative samples that tested negative. In our case, we have a total of 8 actual negative samples, and 7 of them tested negative. So our specificity is 7 divided by 8, or 87.5%. We next examine the prevalence. The prevalence is defined as the fraction of all test samples that are actual positives. In our test case, we have a total of 12 samples, and 4 are actual positives. So our prevalence is 4 divided by 12, or 33.3%. The prevalence is a very important measure of the data set, but it is not a measure of the diagnostic test performance. While the sensitivity and specificity may not change as the prevalence increases or decreases, the three remaining diagnostic performance metrics are very dependent on the prevalence, so it is very important to calculate and communicate the prevalence of your test data set. Next, we will calculate the positive predictive value. The positive predictive value is defined as the fraction of test positive samples that are actual positive samples. In other words, if your test method gives a positive result, what fraction of the time is that the correct answer? In our test set, we have a total of four samples that tested positive, but only three of them were actual positives. So the positive predictive value is 3 divided by 4 or 75 percent. Our next diagnostic performance metric, the negative predictive value, is very similar to the positive predictive value. The negative predictive value is defined as the fraction of test negative samples that are actual negative samples. In other words, if your test method gives a negative result, what fraction of the time is that the correct answer? In our test set, we have a total of 8 samples that tested negative, but just 7 of them were actual negative samples. So our negative predictive value is 7 divided by 8, or 87.5%. Lastly, we can calculate the efficiency. The efficiency is defined as the fraction of all samples whose test status matched the actual status. In other words, for the entire test set, how often did the test method give the correct answer? In our test set, we have a total of 12 samples. Three were true positives, and seven were true negatives. So, 10 of the samples gave the correct answer by the test method. Our efficiency is thus calculated to be 10 divided by 12, or 83.3%. When you apply these diagnostic performance metrics to your test method, 
it is important to use, use as large a test set as possible and to include several actual negative and actual positive samples. If the test set includes only actual positives or actual negatives, it is impossible to calculate all the performance metrics. Also, it is very important to report the prevalence of your test set, as many of the diagnostic performance metric values depend on the value of the prevalence. Segment 5, Optimization and Validation of LAMP Assays. After you have generated multiple LAMP primer sets, or signatures, you are now ready to optimize and validate them. We suggest that you follow a four-step pipeline, including pre-analytical screening, analytical screening, pre-clinical screening, and clinical screening. In each stage, candidate LAMP primer sets are characterized and down-selected hopefully resulting in a small number of validated LAMP signatures with optimal diagnostic performance. The first step in the pipeline is pre-analytical screening. In this stage, every candidate LAMP primer set or signature is tested against extracted purified DNA and buffer from every available target, non-target, as well as no template controls, NTCs, which are simply blank test samples. This round of testing is simply a gross measurement of the sensitivity and specificity of candidate signatures. Secondly, at this stage the reaction parameters are optimized. After a few cycles of optimization and characterization using DNA extracts and buffer, any candidate signatures with unacceptable sensitivity do not amplify targets or unacceptable specificity, amplify non-targets or NTCs, are eliminated from further consideration. During pre-analytical screening, the LAMP reactions are optimized. This is accomplished by varying the concentrations of reagents, including primers, DNTPs, magnesium, etc. Also, the temperature of the isothermal amplification is optimized. Finally, the optimal values for the threshold and cutoff levels are selected to give optimal sensitivity and specificity. The second stage in the pipeline is analytical screening. In this stage, the limit of detection, or LOD, is measured for each candidate LAMP signature against DNA extracts and buffer for every available target. Any signatures with unacceptable LODs are eliminated from further testing. The third stage in the pipeline is preclinical screening. Up to this point, all the LAMP reactions used extracted purified DNA and buffer as the test samples. Now we will conduct additional rounds of testing for targets and non-targets in more complex test matrices. The test matrices are designed to mimic the test matrix of the final application as closely as possible. Test samples may include biological matrices spiked with known amounts of extracted purified DNA or spiked with intact target organisms. At this stage, sample extraction and purification protocols may also be tested. At the completion of preclinical screening, any signatures with unacceptable sensitivity or specificity are eliminated. The final stage in the pipeline is clinical screening. In this phase, the LAMP signatures are tested against real-world sam samples. As discussed in segment 4 of this presentation, a large set of test samples is tested by a reference method. After testing each clinical sample with each candidate LAMP signature, two by two contingency tables are constructed and the diagnostic performance metrics are calculated. Candidate signatures with poor sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, or efficiency are eliminated. At the end of this step, the remaining candidate LAMP signatures are now clinically validated and ready for further characterization and testing.
Conclusions LAMP is a new isothermal nucleic acid amplification technique that is growing in popularity and maturing rapidly. LAMP is well suited for applications with limited resources, small test menus, and a need for rapid detection. LAMP primer design is more complex than PCR, but is facilitated by automated tools. LAMP primer design best practices should be followed to generate high quality candidate primer sets. The requirements of the application or end users will guide selection of one of multiple LAMP detection techniques. The diagnostic performance of LAMP assays is measured using defined performance metrics. Systematic optimization and down selection of candidate LAMP primer sets may be used to choose the best LAMP signature for your application. References The references cited in this presentation are listed below. Acknowledgements I gratefully acknowledge the assistance of my co-workers and colleagues at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and at the University of California, Davis. Funding was provided by National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, NIBIB, National Institutes of Health, United States Department of Health and Human Services, grant number 1U54EB007959. Thank you.